It is almost 11 a.m. in Singapore and Shanghai. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm Haslinda Amin. Here are the top stories. Oil jumping as U.S. officials confirm Israel has struck targets inside Western Iran. Brent rising above 90 bucks a barrel and fears of a major Middle East escalation. Treasuries gain with the dollar and gold as growing risk sends investors scrambling for haven assets. Asian equities sliding. We have a great lineup of guests to discuss the sentiment on the markets. Barclays President Stephen Dainton joins us in just a couple of minutes. Plus, we speak with leading energy consultant Feridun Fesharaki on oil. All markets in risk off mode. Let's get to Avril Hong for a very close look. Avril. Yeah, Haas, we're seeing this wave of risk aversion gripping markets. And this was a reaction that we saw even despite initially those reports being unverified. It's clearly a case of investors selling first and then asking questions later. Traders not quite prepared for this sudden revival of Middle East tensions. And to be clear, we already saw markets mostly in the red and this was on the backdrop of those fed speakers coming in hawkish we also heard from the likes of tsmc for example lowering its outlook for the chip sector so the chips were really already badly hit and then as the nikkei opened one percent lower really sagged those losses accelerated as those reports about these uh, explosions in iran iraq syria started trickling in now we're also seeing the msci asia Pacific, a gauge of stocks in the region hovering at the lowest level since early February. Now we're seeing Brent, uh, US crude futures, they're both rising almost $3 a barrel uh, above the $90 uh, handle. And we're also uh, watching out for the implied volatility. Take a look at this chart if we can, and it'll show you that that implied volatility on crude is surging. So this suggests that we could see even more days like this, the swings in the price action. And this makes you wonder exactly what this is going to mean for people that are watching the inflation front. Now, I want to take you to what we're seeing on the safe havens as well. Uh, the usual suspects are moving. We're seeing it on the dollar, yen, Swiss franc, gold, treasuries as well. Worth highlighting here, we're seeing the yen moving below the 154 level against the greenback. The Swiss franc, it jumped as much as 1.2% against the US dollar earlier on in the session. And this is worth noting because the Swiss franc has been capped recently due to dollar strength. So the moves today indicate how the Middle East tensions uh, are perhaps a bigger mover compared to the Fed bets, Haas. That's right. Classic haven play. 10-year treasury yields. Look at that. 10 basis points. Evil Hong, thank you. Now, the latest on our top story, U.S. officials confirming in the last few minutes that Israel has struck targets in Western Iran. Thus, after multiple reports from Iranian news agencies of explosions heard around the city of Isfahan. For the latest, let's bring in Bloomberg senior editor Bill Ferris. Bill, what do we know at this stage? Well, it's still uh, still really the first hour here of these reports coming in. We have, as you mentioned, two U.S. officials confirming that uh, Israel launched a missile strike on western Iran. We have seen multiple unverified reports uh, of explosions uh, taking place around the region. There's some thought that uh, this these may be uh, drones as well getting hit. We just don't know that much. Isfahan, as you mentioned, uh, is the site where there was a report of an explosion. That is also a city known for having a number of military bases and facilities. It's believed to be one of the places that Iran launched its April 13th attack uh, on Israel from. So it would seem to be a natural target. But in terms of what has actually been hit, whether there are any casualties, those details have really not come in yet. We're just trying to find out the, the scope of what uh, appears to be taking place, possibly still taking place as we speak. That's right. I mean, it's been decades long shadow war. The concern really is now that war is coming out to the open. I mean, what are the risks of that? What are people saying right now? Well, there had been a lot of pressure coming uh, on Pri Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu 
after Iran's barrage of drones and missiles last weekend uh, to, to have Israel not really respond or not respond in force. Uh, Netanyahu and other top officials said that they had to respond in some way. It's really the nature of that response that people are going to be looking at very carefully. There will be a big difference, I think, between uh, you know, striking, a, a, destroying a runway at a military base versus hitting a barracks full of troops or anything like that. So uh, it's too, it's really too soon to know the extent and the damage caused. Uh, but those are the kind of things I think people will be looking at to see, does this in fact really amount to a significant escalation? Tensions are already quite high uh, given all everything else going on in that region. And uh, no one has an interest in seeing a, a much broader war break out between Iran and Israel. So lots of questions out there. Bloomberg Senior Editor Bill Ferris, thank you so much for that. And for more on what all this means for our oil markets, we'll be joined later in the show by Faradin Fesharaki, the founder and chairman of energy consultancy FGE. And let's get straight to our special guest joining us exclusively, Stephen Dainton. Barclays Bank President, Head of Investment Bank Management. This is his first interview since taking up his new roles in February. Good to have you with us. I mean, we, we heard from um, Avril earlier about how it is a haven play. We're seeing traders gravitating towards uh, gold, towards dollar, towards treasuries. What is the ultimate hedge against geopolitical risks in the Middle East right now? Well, firstly, thank you for having me here. And I think what you're seeing is uh, undoubtedly uh, a rapid uh, move away from risk assets. Risk assets during the course of this year have accreted uh, substantially and you're seeing even this morning uh, with elevated geopolitical risk uh, in the Middle East that has been evident over the course of the last four months, five months, uh, really come to the fore. Where are investors moving? And I think it's very important. They're defaulting to safety. You've highlighted a number of them this morning. Uh, gold. Gold has been up over 20 percent during the course of this year. It's acted uh, extremely well. Energy continues to be a place where uh, clients are migrating capital to actively uh, with uh, significant velocity. But then you also have to look at commodities because this is causing a massive break in supply chain concerns. Uh, and I think you'll see a continuation of that concern evolving during the course uh, of the next uh, four or five weeks uh, as more details come out of what's actually happened uh, today. But in aggregate, I think you will see this flight to safety continue. Uh, and a deflation uh, of risk assets that we've seen really since the start of this year. Stephen, how do you reflect all of that in your portfolio, bearing in mind if you take a look at treasuries and where yields are headed, and bearing in mind as well that tensions are likely to escalate from here? It is. Uh, look, I think what you're seeing is now a uh, move to geopolitical away from central bank divergence, and that migrates week to week. Uh, obviously, over the course of the last six weeks, you've seen a huge uh, shift in where the Fed uh, are looking to move. Uh, you've had three prints of uh, CPI that are uh, difficult for the Fed. Uh, and I think you've now got this huge anticipation that started with seven cuts this year, uh, migrating to very possibly one or two for the balance of this year. You have the central bank in Europe uh, articulating a clear path to begin that um, reduction in interest rates in June. So this central bank divergence uh, has been right at the forefront of clients over the course of uh, the last six weeks in particular. Uh, if you look at how geopolitics emerges and uh, lessens uh, in that uh, framework, uh, I think today's events are demonstrating a huge risk off uh, awareness. Um, but that risk off awareness has been underway for a number of weeks. We were talking earlier in the show uh, about uh, volatility in mm. energy. Actually, equity vol is up 40 percent this year. So you've seen equity markets begin to anticipate, uh, given the accretion over the course of the last uh, three months, um, some elevated level of concern. Uh, and that's been reflected uh, again this morning. And oil and 90 bucks a barrel, some saying could get up to 100, perhaps even 120. Bearing in mind what the IMF said overnight, if we see a 15 percent upside in oil prices, we'll see inflation up 0.7 percent. How will that shape the thinking of the Fed and where it goes from here? Well, it's extremely important for the Fed. Um, and I think, you know, energy prices are a major contributor, as you know. I think, you know, nothing impacts uh, U.S. citizens more than the price of oil, um, given the price of uh, gas at the pump. Uh, and I think that that will be of major concern, not only for the Fed, but the political system uh, in the U.S. 
Uh, I think, however, I go back to uh, what you've seen over the course of the last two years with geopolitical events, uh, events in Ukraine, uh, events uh, this year, last year in the Middle East, uh, real concerns about supply chain. Uh, the nearshoring uh, of uh, assets in the U.S. in particular, the friendshoring uh, has been a massive theme. And I think you'll continue to see uh, this impact on supply chains uh, in particular um, also be a factor in commodity prices. Uh, the price of copper up substantially this year, the price of aluminium up substantially this year, all, by the way, uh, within the context of a very weak uh, Chinese economy, mm. uh, which is truly extraordinary. So I think you're seeing not only geopolitical events come to bear, but you are seeing uh, this very significant change in supply chain and supply chain management uh, be a material issue. You talk about high of all, even for equities. What are you advising clients to do? And what are you hearing from your clients? What's happening with their risk appetite? Is it higher or are they hedging against risk? Well, you saw a number of clients at the start of this year move very, very consciously into equity assets. And you saw that through uh, the lens of what is going on in Japan. The Japanese equity market rallied over 20% this year. Obviously, you've seen a compression in the course of the last four weeks. But that was reflected in most major equity markets. Uh, if you look at what was going on in the US, the S&P traded up to 10%. Um, people were trying to find growth, so they were becoming very comfortable uh, with the inflationary cycle coming down. Uh, if you look at what the Fed's anticipated moves were, and I highlighted earlier, seven moves anticipated mm -hmm. towards the end of last year, that all gave a huge amount of comfort uh, in equity risk. So you saw equity markets rally very significantly at the start of this year. Uh, actually, I thought they were extremely resilient, um, but investors were desperately trying to find growth. Uh, and I think that that will continue to be a theme uh, over right. uh, the course of the next um, six months, with the caveat that you now have these very substantial events that are interrupting uh, risk awareness. And for Barclays, how are you boosting ROE at a time when you're also kind of like downsizing? It's a lean organization. Well, I think Venkat laid out very clearly a, a, a statement with an investor day on the 20th of February. Uh, that statement was to uh, demonstrate a simpler, more balanced uh, business in Barclays. Uh, we have an investment bank that is very diverse across asset classes, across the macro business, the equity business, the credit business, and the securitized products business. So we're very diverse from a product perspective, capable of transacting for clients uh, across the entire asset class spectrum. Uh, secondly, we're also very diverse from a geographic perspective. I'm here in Asia uh, this week. Um, and we've had more than 50 years of relevance here uh, in Asia, big business in India. Perhaps we'll talk about that later. Um, but so we have a diverse portfolio of businesses within the IB, uh, very capable of providing solutions in, in positive risk awareness and negative risk awareness. Uh, Stephen, before we go for a, a very short break, just uh, to touch on currencies, we're seeing a full lot in Asian currencies on the back of the really resilient USD. How do you see this playing out? Look, a strong U.S. dollar is difficult for a number of people. Um, you now have China and the U.S. in very divergent positions from an economic perspective. Uh, you have weak equity markets uh, in China. Uh, you have weak uh, employment markets in China. The last thing they want is a weak currency. Mm -hmm. uh, you have huge dollar strength. It's the default asset of safety. Um, and a Fed that is now uh, looking like it is going to reduce rates at a far slower uh, rate than uh, was previously anticipated. So I think that a strong dollar ultimately uh, is problematic. It's very problematic for emerging markets, as you know. Uh, and I think that uh, until we get clarity through this geopolitical uh, issue, I think the dollar is going to continue to remain strong. And also expectations of intervention among Asian central banks. Stephen Dainton is sticking around. Of course, he is with Barclays. Still ahead this hour, FGE shares their outlook on oil prices as tensions once again flare up between Iran and Israel. Plus, we discuss India's elections and foreign policy with the Ananta Aspen Center. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg.
Well, classic haven play in terms of uh, assets in the markets. Gold futures currently up 4 tenths of 1 percent. 24 7 is the level we're looking at. Also, gains for the USD as well as the yen, and take a look where we are in terms of 10 year yields. 4. 54.45. Of course, uh, U.S. bond yields have fallen pretty much across uh, the curve. Ten-year yields down 10 basis points, as you can see on your screen. Well, let's get you to India. Six-week national elections underway with the first of nearly one billion eligible voters starting to cast their ballots. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg News editor Manika Doshi, who's outside a polling station in the southern city of Chennai, the capital of Tamil Nadu state. Manika, the latest. Well, good morning to you, Haslinda. Uh, this is the world's largest democratic electoral exercise taking place in the fifth largest and fastest growing economy in the world and therefore has not just domestic implications but international implications as well. And it's a morning that I should remind you that India is amongst the few countries that has ties with both Israel and Iran. Coming back to the elections, like you mentioned, I am in Chennai in Tamil Nadu, one of the southern states in India that has so far resisted Prime Minister Modi's charm, and that makes it a fierce battle that his party seeks to fight here over the course of the next six phases to come, uh, though Chennai will finish voting today. The goal that Prime Minister Modi has is not just to win a third term, but to win it with a supermajority that's 400 seats of 543. We'll know by June 4th if he is succeeded. That's right. And all eyes on India, of course, a favorite market has had a stellar run, prompting a lot of people to say that valuations are overextended. But still, they say, pumping money into that market. But that's right, Linda. It's an expensive market, undoubtedly, but it's also a market that seems to transmit earnings growth in a more efficient fashion. As uh, JP Morgan was saying, uh, you know, uh, to Bloomberg just a few days ago, and it's also a market that's pricing in the growth story that we've been discussing now since last year when India was hosting the G20. The potential for India to in many ways replace uh, China as the engine of growth for the world economy. So it's a market that's pricing both of that in. It depends on whether you're looking at the short end or the longer term of the market to determine. That's right. Money to be made right there. Bloomberg's Manika Doshi in Chennai. Thank you so much uh, for that. Let's get to our guest, Stephen Dainton, Barclays Bank president and head of investment bank management is still with us. Let's have your take on India. It's trading at 23 times forward earnings. For the most part, people say it is expensive. But when you take a look at 8, 9, 10 percent growth potential, it's still a good opportunity to put in money. I think what you've seen very clearly over the course of the last two or three years uh, is a significant migration of foreign capital to India, um, demonstrated by growth. You have 7 percent GDP growth. Actually, Barclays has been in uh, India for 40 years. We have a uh, perhaps the most um, a balanced um, bank uh, outside of the UK in India across the private bank, the investment bank and the corporate bank. Uh, and I think what you've seen is uh, a true change in investors' mindset to find stability and growth. Uh, and I think that's really the migration from China towards India uh, as foreign capital has uh, for the last 20 years been fully invested in China, invested in the enormous growth story in China. Uh, and I think with some of the political concerns, the geopolitical concerns that we talked about previously, um, that capital is now migrating towards uh, India. Uh, it doesn't mean that it will migrate uh, entirely. Of course not. Look at the scale of what uh, China has. Mm. Um, but undoubtedly, India has positioned itself uh, as a manufacturing center, an energy center, uh, a developed or developing market. Uh, with very significant demographic and GDP growth prospects. People are expecting volatility during this election and they say it is a buying opportunity. Would you agree? 
I think what you've seen investors do is through uh, each election, remember this year on this planet, we have more elections than we have ever had in the democratic uh, world. Uh, I think you'll see markets react to uh, changes in politics. Capital finds stability. It finds stability and it finds growth. Uh, and I think uh, India has uh, demonstrated over the course of the last five, six years uh, that it can provide that stability for capital, for foreign capital to come, uh, encourage growth, and it's had a very consistent growth profile over the course of the last two years. A lot of traders look at India in the context of China. We had China coming out today saying that it wants, uh, you know, a capital market reform, saying that it wants to focus more on value as opposed to speculation, which has driven the market so far. Is that game a game changer for you? No, no look, I think um, uh, central banks, uh, politicians uh, have to be consistent. More than anything, capital loves consistency. As I said earlier, it loves stability. Uh, I think with some of the changes uh, in China during the course of the last three years, uh, change in political regulation around certain industries, uh, capital has become concerned. Uh, changes in geopolitical events, capital has become concerned. In India, they're seeing all of the elements of an emerging market the growth um, uh, opportunities that I touched on, plus it also growing its presence uh, across the emerging market portfolio as a whole. Uh, so I think that uh, India, uh, given what it has done in the last five years, truly demonstrating that stability, demonstrating an ability to grow, will continue to accrete foreign capital. So when you look at Asia as a whole, where do you see the biggest opportunities? Some say perhaps it is Japan's time, given a revival in investor sentiment there. I think Japan is extremely interesting. Um, you saw Japan perform exceptionally well last year, a big change in the dynamic of the central bank. Japan moves slowly, uh, but it's very deliberate uh, and it has duration. So I think that you will see uh, risk capital find Japanese assets over the course of the next two, five, ten years. Um, so I think Japan is extremely interesting. But in that mosaic of Asia, uh, you have some unbelievable growth opportunities in Southeast Asia. Uh, if I look at what has happened, and each economy will oscillate at different levels. Uh, but if you look at what is going on in Indonesia and in Malaysia, uh, if you look at what is happening right here in Singapore uh, and the growth opportunities here in Singapore, and then obviously Australia, um, that continues to be a huge resource center for the planet. So I think uh, Asia in general continues to exhibit growth. If it can continue to exhibit stability, it will then accrete foreign capital at a faster and faster rate. Yet we're seeing emerging markets in this part of the world being pretty much lackluster, underperforming. What will it take to change? Do you expect that change to come this year? Well, when China falls, EM should rally. I mean, so you should have that dichotomy. Uh, the dollar is an issue. Uh, the dollar strength puts enormous pressure on emerging markets. And I think that you do have to see uh, the dollar start to soften to bring that um, change in emerging market mentality. I think you also have to see liquidity. Uh, and I think really it's incumbent on um, the market participants to continue to provide liquidity into those markets. Fundamentally, um, the emerging markets are growing. They're growing at a faster clip than the emerged markets. Uh, and I think that ultimately in the course of the next two years uh, will be critical for foreign capital and domestic capital. Uh, Stephen, I want to take a look at the banking sector as a whole. It's no secret that most banks have been cutting jobs. I mean, have we seen the worst? I think what you've seen is every industry goes through uh, various cycles. Uh, they adapt their workforce uh, for that cycle. Uh, I think a number of the U.S. banks have already reported uh, this year. Uh, mostly they reported uh, very credible results uh, during the course uh, of uh, their reporting season. Uh, and I think that you will continue to see them focus on efficiency. Um, in the course of the last year, most of us have learned about AI. Uh, we haven't yet understood the full opportunities and use cases of AI through, uh, through the industry and through industries. So I think there's a number of elements that are coming to help uh, the banking system, help industry as a whole, uh, create greater efficiency. Okay, just one final question. When it comes to Barclays itself, are you at the tail end of it when it comes to job cuts? Look, we, we, we go through a, a workforce planning uh, process like every industry. Um, it is dependent on the shape of the portfolio of the businesses. It's dependent on uh, the market environment. Uh, and I think that, you know, most importantly, as Venkat laid out, 
uh, in February, uh, we are extremely focused on cost discipline within the organization. We have a, uh, a large ambition to improve uh, our profitability uh, from 10% to 12%, and Venkat laid that out very clearly right. uh, in February. Stephen, great to have you with us. Come visit again, Stephen Dainton of Barclays. Let's get you to markets right now where there is risk aversion pretty much uh, across the board. Take a look at where we are in terms of those haven plays getting bid up uh, on the back of resurgent uh, risks in the Middle East. Take a look where we are in terms of the MSCI Asia Pacific Index uh, trading at session lows right now. And the big losers at this point in time in terms of benchmarks include the Topix, the Nikkei, as well as the TIEX. They're down more than 3%. And in the FX space, it is a strong dollar story, uh, putting a lot of pressure on Asian currency. Take a look where we are in terms of the one down more than 1%. The PASO low by 7 tenths of 1%. The yen getting a bit up. It is traditionally a haven play. In terms of commodities, it is about crude oil. WTI crude up 2.7%. And that, of course, uh, brings that question, what happens to that fight against inflation? Well, coming up, the latest on energy markets with FGE's Faradun Fashiraki, as the U.S. confirms, Israeli strikes and targets inside Iran. That is next. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Let's get to Avril Hong for the very latest risk off. Off. And there is a lot of safe haven demand in a way. This is a textbook case, classic example of how geopolitics can really throw a span into the works of financial markets. Today, we're seeing a bid for safe havens, whether you're looking at the dollar, the Swiss franc or the yen. Gold is also catching a bid. But a couple of things I wanted to highlight here in terms of safe haven demand. Uh, we're seeing the Swiss franc really burnishing its credentials as the safe haven of choice. It is rising against the euro and the greenback at a time where it seems like those monetary policy concerns, well, they're really being eclipsed by geopolitical tensions. Bitcoin also slumping today. And this is, of course, an asset class that in the past has been spoken about, touted as a hedge against geopolitical risk. Well, that uh, argument really endowed today. Flip the board because I want to show you just how the risk aversion is creeping into across assets. And we're seeing that showing up in the stock markets of Taiwan and Japan that uh, is moving off session lows but still really negative. MSCI Asia Pacific still hovering near the lowest level since February. We're also seeing the Asian currencies under pressure, renewed concerns amid the surge in oil prices. Brent, of course, moving past the $90 handle at one point, uh, creeping back below that at the moment, Haas. Well, that's right. Bagging the question, what happens to inflation? For more on crude markets, our senior energy reporter, Stephen Stepchinsky. Why am I tripping over your name today, Stephen? Stephen Stepchinsky joining us now. Uh, well, we're talking about $100 oil yet again. Yeah, we are. I mean, we're not quite there yet. Uh, oil prices are pretty volatile this morning. They jumped above $90 Brent, uh, which was a 3 to 4% increase. Um, but now they're kind of coming back down a little bit, back below $90. The market is going to be volatile as they digest what's happened with the, um, with the response from Israel. Uh, there are reports that, uh, you know, Ar Iran has been able to shoot down some of the drones, uh, that their nuclear sites were not um, hit. If the nuclear sites were hit, and that would kind of uh, show another ratcheting up of, of uh, tension between Israel and Iran, further spiraling the conflict uh, deeper in the Middle East. But we're not seeing that at the moment. You know, I think the market is really just seeing if this whole situation escalates to another level. Um, and with prices coming down a little bit for oil, it doesn't seem to be, you know, the market seems to be sort of taking a small sigh of relief. But everyone is anxious, anxiously awaiting what's going to happen next. One focus point, of course, is going to be what happens with the Strait of Hormuz. It's a very unlikely scenario right now that the key uh, waterway that, that Iran uh, is on Iran's border uh, could, could be shut. But that is a, a waterway that, that has 30% uh, of global oil 
trade as well as 20% of liquefied natural gas. If that were to close or if uh, supplies through there would be disrupted, that would be uh, a huge ratcheting up of pressure and see oil and gas prices spike. But again, that is still a remote scenario, but it is sort of the worst case scenario that the market is obviously anxious about. I guess the big uh, but it does seem that right now, uh, tension in the Middle East is something that they're watching. Uh, Stephen, overall though, are we looking at oil markets tightening? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, if you if you look at where we are with, with there is uh, beyond the conflict in the Middle East, we are in a um, a tighter market than we were months back. Um, there are some analysts saying that we're in a deficit uh, now. Could we rise towards a hundred dollars? You know, Goldman had a note out this morning saying that ninety dollars Brent. Uh, is sort of the um, uh, a ceiling right now, uh, but it really depends on who you ask. Everyone kind of has a different different look at it. But uh, OPEC Plus has tightened the market by uh, cutting barrels from the market through through the next um, few months through the end of the second quarter. Uh, how they're going to respond uh, going into the third quarter and fourth quarter is going to be something that's going to be closely watched because they could add uh, supply and help add some cushion to where we are. Uh, so certainly there is a uh, there are fundamentals backing up uh, oils uh, move higher over the last few months, especially since the start of the year, as we've seen oil trek towards the ninety hundred dollar level. But today, speaking specifically about today, is clearly driven by uh, folks watching uh, the the Israel's uh, retaliation uh, to Iran and the explosions in Iran and how to kind of digest that to see what happens next. Is Iran going to respond again or is this the end of it? Stephen Stepchinski, a senior energy reporter, thank you so much for that. Let's stay with energy markets and get more perspective. Ferdinand Fesharaki, founder and chairman of FGE, which is an international energy consultancy. Good to have you with us. Thank you. How are you reading the resurgence in terms of risk in the Middle East? Well, we have to separate the uh, short-term political risk from the fundamentals. The fundamentals are still very strong. If there was nothing, no, no political risk added, uh, the prices would rise to 95, 98, maybe $100 the second half of the year. And then OPEC Plus has to decide, can we, shall we put some volume in or shall we just wait? If they don't put any volume in there, the prices will hit $100 a barrel. Uh, political risks, 4 or $5. There is no big political risk in this market because OPEC Plus has 6 million barrels per, per capacity. And everybody knows if their supplies are cut, it's overnight they can increase the volumes and make up the difference. When we talk about risk, some are looking at the Straits of Homers, as Stephen Sachimsky was talking about earlier. How are you assessing the risk of a closure? I'm sorry, this is a nonsense question. Because people think that the Strait of Hormuz is a one-way street, that only oil goes out. 80% of the food in Iran comes in through the Strait of Hormuz. You close the Strait of Hormuz, you starve the people inside of Iran. So it may be uh, something for a few days, maybe one week, uh, as a sort of a uh, show, you know, show of force, but it cannot be closed because the Iranian population will starve without the Strait of Hormuz. If it happens, though, because some people say it might happen, if it happens, how might it affect the market? How will this play out? If it happens, it can increase the prices $20, $30 a barrel, but still, it is a lot of spare capacity. And at that time, all the sanctions against Russia needs to be suspended uh, because we need the Russian oil. Russian oil is uh, actually capacity to export is now bigger than the pre-sanction period. Uh, so you have to open the hands on them, Venezuela, a lot of other people. But uh, the possibility is really one in 10,000. Mm, we talked about possibly a tightening market. How are you assessing that in relation to perhaps demand from China? Uh, China's economy is beginning to recover and it may demand uh, more oil on the back of that. Well, Chinese oil demand grew by 1.6 million barrels per day last year. This year is only 400,000. Chinese oil demand will peak by 2027, so close by. Uh, and this is a very big change in the global market because the, the world has been waiting for China to come in and rescue the market whenever there is a, an issue. That uh, role is going to cease. The Chinese will be, for the next last 20 years, they controlled the, glo the global demand by uh, having the m massive consumption. Uh, they're going to do the same role with LNG for the next 20 years. But the oil chapter 
is going to be closed. We know that the U.S. House of Representatives is looking at a legislation banning China from buying Iranian oil. What impact might that have? Well, Chinese statistics show that there is zero Iranian oil imported. But uh, imports from Malaysia is one, one million barrels per day, although Malaysia only produces 400,000 barrels per day. Imports from Oman are bigger than the total Omani production. This is all Iranian oil renamed. And the Biden administration has deliberately turned a blind eye. And as long as Biden is in the office, I don't think there will be any change. Mm. And in terms of U.S. looking at reimposing uh, sanctions as well as restrictions on Venezuela, would that have a major impact? No, Venezuela is a bit re irrelevant. The sanctions or no sanctions make a 200,000 barrels per day difference. Venezuelan oil industry is uh, destroyed by Mr. Chavez and by Mr. Maduro. It takes five to ten years of sane management to bring them back to three million barrels per day. But at the moment, it's all a matter of a couple of hundred thousand. So that will not. Makes no cause, cause prices to, to hike. But Iran, Iran, uh, you know, Iranian oil production now is almost near capacity. So if either uh, we wait, wait for President Trump come, to come in there and impose real sanctions that he put in place, or if uh, some, by some dramatic change, the U.S. changes policy, the Iranian production will go down by a million, million and a half barrels per day, which the Saudis will make it overnight. Uh, Faradun, we know that OPEC Plus has extended uh, that lid on production. How much longer do you think that will persist, given that Saudi Arabia actually needs oil at 100 bucks a barrel to balance its budget? I don't believe in these numbers of the, they need so much. The Saudis, uh, they manage the system very well. Uh, basically, in the Middle East, the more money you have, the more money you spend. If you have less, then you are being more careful. Uh, so I think that this to say that they need $100, no, everybody needs more money, but uh, they can manage with far less. And uh, they have been, I mean, if you uh, visited the, the country, the country has just been so dramatically changed. Everything is so dramatically changed. So lots more flexibility there than uh, financial analysts give it credit to. We know you have great insights into the energy sector, energy space and market. Is there something that perhaps traders and the rest of the world isn't quite understanding when it comes to the energy markets. What, what, what are we missing out on? I think the fundamentals and the prices are disconnected. Uh, why does prices, do prices go to $83? There is $5 maybe, uh, this premium in the price today. But why is it there? The fundamentals are so strong. We are going to go higher prices, and if we have some minor change because of the geopolitics, it will be corrected, self-corrected by itself. We are going to $9,500, and the key thing to look for is that is OPEC Plus going to add in 250, 500,000, maybe even a million barrels per day or not in the second, in the, in the third or fourth quarter of the year, not in the second quarter. And I think they will do it, because if they don't do it, prices will go above $100. Faridun, thank you so much for joining us today. Faridun Fasharaki of you. FGE. Keep an eye on OPEC Plus in the coming quarters. Still to come, the world's biggest election gets underway in India. We'll get the insights of Ananta Aspen C Centre CEO on what's at stake in the six-week voting exercise. Keep it here with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Markets Asia. You're watching India Focus. India starts trading in under two minutes and futures pointing to a lower open. Sensex down 7 tenths to 1%. Keep a very close eye on oil prices. This is one market that imports most of its oil needs. Oil, of course, trading above that 90 bucks a barrel, reversing losses today, jumping more than 3%. Again, all the benchmarks in India pointing to a lower open. We're keeping a watch on Infosys. Uh, and, of course, uh, Brent crude on the back of that. Infosys falling 2.4% in pre-market trading. Let's stay with India, head back to Chennai for the start of India's elections. And Bloomberg's Manaka Doshi is there. Manaka, tensions in the Middle East, sending oil prices higher. Will higher fuel prices be a challenge? 
for the economy. Undoubtedly, there will be, Haslinder. As you pointed out, India is a very large importer of crude oil, and we've seen the various tactics that the country had to deploy to be able to meet its oil requirements when the Ukraine war broke out and sanctions were imposed on Russia. Now, you know, it, I must say that as election gets underway in India, and you know there are six more phases, this is going to go on all the way till June 1st. It's very difficult to tell what the Middle East situation will be. But let me put it this way to you, that the more fragile this world looks to Indian voters, the more they're going to seek, uh, you know, a strong leader. And we do know that those are qualities or attributes they seem to have identified with Prime Minister Modi. And Manika, we know that India has relations with both Iran and Israel. How might this play out in terms of the thinking in India? Well, I do know we've called in the past week for de-escalation of the crisis in the Middle East after we saw the Iran strikes. Unfortunately, I have not been able to reach out and find out what the government's comments are this morning because I've been parked here in Chennai. Uh, but I'm sure they will be looking at the situation in two ways. One is, of course, the geopolitical fallout, and the other is the economic fallout on the economy here in India. And I'm going to wrap by saying this quickly. We we may not see any immediate transmission of higher oil prices to voters or citizens um, because Indian government oil companies tend to not move prices higher if they feel the mood is not welcoming. That's the most uh, diplomatically I can put it. So it does seem <laughs> as if oil will not translate into a more expensive commodity in India, at least over the next few weeks. But that depends on whether it stays southward of 100 or rises above that. Well put, Manika. Thank you so much for that. Bloomberg's Manika Doshi in Chennai. And we have uh, a headline to tell you about from the New York Times suggesting that Iran officials are saying the strike hit its military air base near Isfahan. And this is uh, as reported by the New York Times. It says that Iran officials have said that the strike has hit military air base near Isfahan. Now, let's find out what Middle East tensions and higher oil could mean for India's foreign policy. Joining us from New Delhi is Indrani Bakshi, CEO of Ananta Aspen Center, which is a think tank and research group on international relations as well as public policy. Good to have you with us. I'm just wondering, put this in perspective yeah. for us, this Middle East conflict and what that may mean for India. Well, uh, as, as you said a little earlier, Israel is a very close uh, partner of India. Uh, Iran is a traditional partner of India. Uh, we do no longer buy oil from Iran as a result of the sanctions. But uh, uh, any d uh, instability in that part of the world will impact India um, very much because uh, we have, uh, as you know, we have about 9 million Indians living and working in the Gulf. Um, that by itself makes any um, geopolitical tension become a source of political and economic tension in India. Uh, that apart, India has invested deeply in its foreign policy in the Gulf, particularly with Saudi Arabia, Isra uh, Israel, and the UAE. Um, all of these nations right now will be focusing or are focusing on the Israel-Iran strikes. And we've seen the results of the strikes this morning. Uh, all of these will have an impact on how India sees the region because instability is not something India is very comfortable with. I don't know if you have followed this, but uh, after the Israel strikes on Iran, uh, after the Iranian strikes on Israel last weekend, um, Iran seized an, um, a, a ship, uh, a merchant ship, uh, the MSC Ares, uh, with its 17 Indian uh, crewmen in it. And it, this has been held hostage by Iran for the last one week. Uh, they released one woman crew member this morning, but uh, that's another thing that adds to India's troubles because, you know, there right. are Indians having to be uh, evacuated from troubled spots uh, all over the world. Uh, so you would say that India has adopted the right foreign policy in the Middle East to ensure its oil supplies? 
Well, in the, see, the thing is, uh, the oil supplies are still a, mar- a factor of market uh, forces. Uh, the, we buy oil from uh, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, uh, uh, Russia. These are our top uh, oil sources. I don't think any of them would be affected by what uh, is happening right now. Uh, yes, if there are connectivity issues. Oh, uh, did I forget to mention that the, is that the U.S. is become one of our biggest sources of uh, natural gas as well. Mm. Uh, but uh, it, uh, it, connectivity or connectivity problems in in this region will have an impact. Uh, but that apart, I mean, we've been through the Russia-Ukraine war and uh, the Indian government has um, kept prices stable. Uh, pr- energy stability or energy price stability is vital for the growth of the Indian right. economy. And you will see more of that intervention by governments coming in as we go along. Indrani, when it comes to relations between India and the US, how might it perhaps develop or deepen with a third term of a Modi government? I think, uh, I think there is a degree of comfort between India and the U.S. uh, today, that has not been there before, Uh, largely because of the emphasis on the U.S. relationship uh, by the Modi government for the past decade. But to be fair to the U.S., uh, a reciprocal uh, emphasis on relations with India by uh, separate U.S. administrations. And I think that will continue. Indrani, just to uh, uh, interrupt you here, we have New York Times also saying that the Israel defense officials has said that its military has struck Iran. New York Times is saying that Israel defense officials have said its military did strike Iran. Of course, we had New York Times saying earlier as well uh, that Israel's military struck Iran, according to uh, two Israeli officials. Uh, We'll continue to bring you those headlines from the New York Times as we get them. Uh, Indrani, in terms of uh, foreign relations, China possibly is the toughest one. Uh, How how might um, a third Modi term uh, define those relations with China? Uh, It is indeed the most difficult relationship. Uh, uh, For all your viewers, you know, uh, there are 100,000 soldiers, troops on either side uh, in a face-to-face situation um, in uh, Ladakh, which is uh, a very, very inhospitable part of the world. Uh, And that has been uh, the case for the last four years. Uh, India has taken uh, some of some steps uh, to de-link or not, well, to decouple its its economy from uh, China, particularly in the area of investments by China in the technology sector um, and in the financial sector. China has not been a big FDI source in India because of security concerns in India, but certainly from TikTok onwards, right. uh, there has been a determined move to uh, separate Indrani? China from India. Yeah, yeah. Indrani, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your thoughts today. Indrani Bachi, Ananta, Aspen Center. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. The New York Times reporting that Israel defense officials say its military has struck Iran and will be continuing our coverage of the developing situation in the Middle East. Well, Daybreak Middle East and Africa anchor Vani Quinn joins us from Dubai. Vani, take us through the latest. Yeah, well, what we do know, Haslinda, is that two officials have confirmed to Bloomberg News that there was a strike, that Israel launched a retaliatory strike on Iran after Iran's semi-official news agency had reported that an explosion was heard in the city of Isfahan. Now, we know that the Isfahan Nuclear Technology Center is based outside the city, around 200 miles. Since then, we've learned that that site is completely safe. That's a direct quotation from Iranian state TV. So you saw this huge reaction in risk assets, a 
massive flight to safety. That's come off the boil just a little bit. Gold is back below $2,400 an ounce. But we are still seeing that flight to safety in the likes of treasuries in the dollar. And we will be continuing to follow all of this, all of these details as they come out. Of course, it's a very fluid situation, as Linda, but it does appear that Iran is downplaying it to an extent. We have television in Iran and other media suggesting that things are continuing as normal. And we also know that Isfahan was one of the sites right. where the Bonnie? April 13th attacks were launched from. It is home to a military base. Ronnie, we have to leave it there and we'll take you through the markets. As Ronnie said, it's risk aversion. We're seeing pretty much uh, havens getting bid up. That is it from Bloomberg Markets Asia. This is Bloomberg.